Welcome, you're joining me here in the heart of the British Library, the home of words and people who love them. In 1770, Elizabeth Montagu wrote, I never invite idiots to my house. Well, neither does the British Library. This next session invites you inside a digital blue stockings salon as part of the upcoming exhibition, Unfinished Business. I'm gonna hand you over now to my chair, Joanna Barker. Thank you, B. Um, I would like to start by introducing our panel for this evening. Uh, first of all, we have Dr. Yutika Sharma from Edinburgh University, um, who works on the art and intellectual history of South Asia in the early modern and colonial period. Um, in fact, she, she used to work in the Asian department of the British Museum and has been involved in the East India Company at Home project. Uh, our second uh, participant is uh, Professor Emma Cleary, who is Professor of English Literature at Uppsala University. Um, and she has written extensively on the blue stockings and also is the author of a very interesting book called Jane Austen, The Banker's Sister. Um, and our final uh, panel member is uh, Dr. Elizabeth Egger, who is a writer and cultural historian and reader emerita at King's College London. She is currently completing a biography of Elizabeth Montague and some years ago, she co-curated the National Portrait Gallery's exhibition called Brilliant Women, wonderful title, uh, which was about the 18th century blue stockings. Now, um, Elizabeth and I are here today, um, well, one reason we're here today is that we are both co-founders of an organization called EMCO, and EMCO stands for Elizabeth Montague Correspondence Online. And this organization is about to launch the digital edition of the letters of Elizabeth Montague. Uh, and the launch will actually be in three weeks time on the 15th of October. Now this correspondence is one of the most important collections of the 18th century. There are an amazing 9,000 letters known to have survived, including 4,000 that are written in Montague's own hand. And the aim of EMCO is to produce a free online digital edition of all her letters together with transcriptions and notes. And including in this will be 46 letters that are held by the British Library. So who was Elizabeth Montague? Well, I'd like to show you a picture which was painted by Richard Samuel in uh, 1779 and is called The Nine Living Muses of Great Britain. Now, in this group of nine ladies, we see a singer, a painter, a poet, a playwright, several writers, and Elizabeth Montague, who's the one seated in the middle holding a scroll. Now, unfortunately, it doesn't look like her at all. These were idealized muses, not real people. So who was the real Elizabeth Montague? She was an author, a businesswoman, a philanthropist, and a patron of the arts. She was a leading woman of letters of her day. And for 50 years, she hosted one of the most celebrated salons in London. So today, we are going to use the spirit of the salon to illustrate the role that Montague and women like her in London in the second half of the 18th century played at a time when London was already regarded as a global city. But I'd like to talk first of all about what this meant in practice. Emma, can you help us? Yes, uh, well, I can try. Um, one of the blue stocking writers, Anna Letitia Barbel, described London as a global city in her poem 1811. She presents it as, to quote her, a mighty city which by every road in floods of people poured itself abroad. The main feature is this sense of openness, of what she calls spontaneous plenty, the sense of commerce as a powerful force which pushes people outwards around the globe, but also draws them into the British metropolis from all corners of the world. She talks about and celebrates ethnic diversity in London's public spaces, streets where the turbaned Muslim bearded Jew and woolly Afric meet, met the brown Hindu, to quote the poem. Um, I'm going to show you the first 
of our images, or rather the second, but the first um, that I'd like to bring forward, which is a painting um, called Commerce, or The Triumph of the Thames, by the Irish artist James Barry. It was one of a series he created to show the progress of human knowledge and culture. For a society that was founded in London in the mid 18th century to encourage artistic and commercial enterprise. The headquarters were located right on the river at Adelphi, not far from um, the present day Trafalgar Square. And this image strongly conveys the imperialist mindset. It's a kind of fever dream of, uh, of, of empire. On the left, you've got giant figures representing the different continents presenting their goods to Father Thames, who's being propelled by a collection of great explorers, Drake, Raleigh, Cabot, and Captain Cook, and surrounded by a ring of sea nymphs, some of them holding up goods manufactured in Manchester and Birmingham, ready to be shipped out to the colonies. On the one hand, there's pride in London as the world's exchange, its openness, and on the other, there's a rather overheated and exclusive patriotism. In the same series of paintings, there's another image. The, this was the annual prize giving for young creatives. It's really striking, I think, how prominent women and girls are at this event and in this image. James Barry, the artist, himself thought that talented women and girls uh, were an important national resource. And the Society of Arts was, um, who awarded the prizes shared this view. Now, right at the center of this image, it's rather like, I don't know if people can locate it, but if you see a girl holding a basket just beyond her is Elizabeth Montague, the queen of the blue stockings herself. Right in the center of the picture, you can see her in profile presenting this girl who has won a prize for needlework. Um, and she's presenting the girl to some aristocratic patrons. Montague was one of the main supporters of this society. This is very much a London image. You have the tip of a sail on the far right and the dome of St. Paul's in the distance. It's about the concentration of capital in the capital, wealthy aristocrats mingling with talented and ingenious professionals in the applied arts. The picture is saying, this is the dynamic mixture which makes London the ideal launch pad for a rising international superpower, Britain. That's very interesting, Emma, but I wonder, I wonder if Elizabeth can tell us a bit more about how women were able to participate in this, because you showed the explorers there, but women were not able to be explorers or ambassadors, and they didn't join the army or the navy and, and go abroad. So, so really, how, how could they be involved? That's a very good question. Um, it's true, as Emma has emphasised, Montague lived in an era of empire building. And while she couldn't travel abroad, she was very concerned with building Britain as a nation. Um, as you saw in the painting of the Nine Muses, she represents Brit Britain's cultural talents as being superior, particularly to that of France. At the end, and it's important to remember that this was an era of global warfare. At the end of the Seven Years' War, after the British had signed a pact of peace with the Cherokee Indians, having been fighting over land in, in the colonies. Elizabeth Montague decided to visit the Cherokee Indians who are on an embassy to London. And I'd like our next image up, please. This portrait is fascinating. It documents the vis visitation of the Cherokee chief and his fellows to London, where they became something of celebrities, appearing at Vauxhall Pleasure Gardens, Ranley, and even visiting the court. What is interesting is that Montague is determined to see them for herself, and she describes them in, in wonderful detail in her letter to Lord Bath. She notices the bright copper color of their face and their, their makeup, 
which she later compares to the Rouge of Salonnières in Paris. And she writes, the general cast of his physiognomy is not amiss, nor is he different in features from an Englishman as our near neighbor, the French. She feels a real empathy with the, the, the chief of the Cherokees. And there's something of a sense of emerging relativ cultural relativism in her conclusion. I wish that interpreter was arrived. He had sadly perished on the journey. Some thought he had been poisoned. I should be glad to hear their observations on what they see here. All civilized people have prejudices in favor of their national customs and therefore do not judge people with candor, those of other countries. So she's aware that they're in the process of judging her and she articulates that very clearly. I think the other way in which she brings the global to London is through the power of her salon. Now this was um, a fascinating space because it was in competition with the court, but it was far more open and diverse to different influences and parties. So it, it soon became known for its support of female education, but also as a place to seek patronage. Um, she wrote to her fellow blue stocking, Elizabeth Vasey, um, at the beginning of, um, of her Hill Street salon, um, about the, fa the fact that she is living at a time of great cultural achievement, the most famous men of the day and the most famous and talented women of any day. Um, later, she, when she more ambitiously built her Portman Square mansion on the prof with the profits of her coal mines, which we'll come to later, she described a little assembly she planned at her house that evening. It will be composed of persons of so many different nations that if each should speak his mother tongue, it would resemble the company at the building of the Tower of Babel. Well, Elizabeth, you, you mentioned the, the two houses that um, Montague built at Hill Street and in Portman Square. And I, I wanted to turn uh, to Utica to talk a bit about how globalization affected the material culture of the time. Um, at her Hill Street uh, house where her salon was held, Montague had a Chinese room. Was, was this typical? Off mute as well, please. That's a really interesting question. Um, it, it, was, it was quite typical of the time. There was a real interest in um, acquiring uh, furnishings and decorating houses um, in the styles and designs inspired by Asia. And um, a lot of this was um, fueled by uh, the growing maritime trade uh, with the Eastern seaports. Um, and um, merchants and traders um, often bought back um, goods that they had commissioned privately. Um, through um, uh, in a, um, um, through private trade uh, channels as supercargoes, and um, uh, this is a there's a great example in that uh, Montague's brother Robert Robinson, who was a naval captain, um, worked for the East India Company and um, brought and brought back um, presents for her very often, and she is known to have um, uh, said, uh, you know, my house looks like an Indian warehouse. Um, I've got so many figures, jars, etc. You would laugh at my collection. The gown that I bought out of the ship is very pretty and the work extremely neat. So um, she was using these um, uh, these furnishings and these presents to adorn her, um, her dressing room, which was uh, which was the main um, the main space in the house itself, uh, where, where where she met uh, her intimate friends. Um, also, the the style that became really popular in the 1750s was chinoiserie, which was basically inspired um, design designs inspired by China, and um, that these were incorporated within um, uh, you know wallpaper furnishings, curtain designs, etc. Um, and she brought in um, a young um, architect by the name of Robert Adam who I encountered in my other work at Osterley uh, when I was working for the East India Company at Home Project. Um, so Adam um, uh, was brought in um, 
to refurbish uh, um, her existing Shinawasari inspired dressing room. Um, and he sort of adapted it to a sort of more neoclassical taste, but with sh uh, Chinese uh, inspiration, with the Shinawasari sort of inspiration. Um, and in fact, um, one of the really striking uh, pieces of designs um, that we have in, this, uh, in the John Soane Museum is um, the carpet that was used in the Hill Street um, dressing room, of which we do have a slide today. Um, and uh, one can see from that particular slide, it was a really interesting mix um, that Adam came up with of um, a, a sort of very neoclassical aesthetic, but then um, you know he interspersed these um, roundels that you see on the corners um, with uh, a, again um, scenes inspired from um, China, and, and also the central roundel itself is something that um, uh, has been talked about in terms of uh, having a, uh, inspiration from um, from the east. So um, she really really fancied her her um, her dressing room I in its earlier phase when it was very shinwazari uh, oriented and this later phase which was more pared down as well and um, she often called it um, the uh, she's quoted um, as saying that it was the dressing um, my dressing is the female of the great room this is what she called it so it's quite interesting that um, the material culture of the time had this um, real inspiration, um, you know, from uh, the growing trade links. Well, that's great. But of course, we must remember it wasn't just pretty pictures, was it? Um, uh, Montague herself complained about the, the nabobs coming back from, from India and buying up country houses in her area of Berkshire. Uh, and their immense wealth came uh, as we must recognize from exploiting and indeed later on from plundering the resources of the East. So what did she think of that? Not pretty patterns at all. Um, there was an entire sort of sensibility in a way around um, uh, the use of Shinwazari and other such uh, inspirations from Asia, uh, the sensibility of taste making and self positioning um, that also went along with the connoisseurs, uh, connoisseurly interest in these designs. Um, and you're right, I mean, these objects were um, in some cases acquired through pri private trade, but a lot of what Montague was observing in, in her vicinity was a sort of arrival of these nabobs. And the nabob is really a term. Um, which is a corruption of the uh, the word um, nawab, which actually refers to um, um, provincial governors and men of influence um, in in the subcontinent, um, mm -hmm. who were very wealthy. And it is known, uh, it is very well known that these East India Company merchants and officers who served um, in the subcontinent became very wealthy very soon, especially um, before 1813, before they were. Um, they were regulated, so to speak, by the government. Um, so in this sort of phase, you know, between the 1750s and 1813 of deregulated sort of um, corporate um, governance um, of the subcontinent, there was a real um, worry about these um, company servants coming back extremely rich. It's said, for example, that they were seen to be dripping in diamonds or stuffing their menageries with beasts. and um, it's, it's true, as, as their control of the colonies grew, um, their wealth grew, and when they came back, they, they exercised their, um, they used this wealth to exercise um, influence over things like buying parliamentary seats or funding investments in new properties or business ventures. And some of these business ventures would have been also in the Caribbean. So um, unlike the, the West Indian, um, uh, company servants, you know, people serving in West India, um, in the West Indies, um, they, they were known, they were looked down upon quite a bit. And one great example is Samuel Foote's 1788 play entitled The Nabob, which made yeah. fun of the Nabobs. But um, they, they were uh, a very divisive um, figure in society. Well, I think we might, we might pursue that uh, theme a bit. Um, but I'm just going to take the opportunity here to uh, say to the audience that if anyone would like to send in any questions, um, you can do so uh, online. Um, and uh, I think it's in the chat box or the Q&A box. And we'll be able to put some of your questions to our panel members uh, later on. But I, I want to come back to this um, 
this theme. Uh, and I'm wondering whether women in Elizabeth Montague's circle, were they cheerleaders or critics of imperialism? Um, I mean, what was their attitude to, uh, to, to his important issues like slavery? E Emma, can you tell us something more about that? Thanks, um, Joanna. Yeah, I think the answer has to be they were both cheerleaders and critics. Um, the women of the blue stocking circle supported the idea of a moral British empire. Some, it's an idealized view of empire which would spread the benefits of trade internationally. Um, but they also condemned slavery as a blot on Britain's reputation. Um, Elizabeth Montagu was born in 1718, so she was 70 years old by the time the campaign to abolish the slave trade really got going, but she took a keen interest. One of the younger blue stockings, Hannah Moore, became a leader of the abolitionist movement and introduced Montagu to William Wilberforce, who was its main representative in Parliament. But earlier in her life, there are really interesting connections between Montague and African intellectuals in London. These links might have influenced her and spurred her interest in abolition. I feel sure she knew about the visit of the African-American poet Phyllis Wheatley from Boston in 1773. Phyllis Wheatley traveled from America to London um, to see her book, Poems on Various Subjects Through the Press. She was something of a sensation, um, treated as a celebrity uh, by the London literati. While Wheatley was in London, we know that she met one of Montague's closest friends, George Littleton, Baron Littleton. And it was reported um, in the newspaper, in an advertisement for Wheatley's poems, that Littleton and other cultured aristocrats were in awe of her genius. Montague would certainly have come across another leading light of the African diaspora, Ignatius Sancho, um, shown in, in the next picture, a really beautiful portrait by Thomas Gainsborough from 1768, now in the National Gallery of Canada. Sancho was the protege of members of the extended Montague family, first as a valet and later when he set up independently as a shop owner in a fashionable part of Westminster. Sancho achieved success as a musician, as a composer and as a writer, and he socialized with well-known actors, artists and authors, white and black. He famously corresponded with Lawrence Stern, the author of Tristram Shandy, who also happened to be a relation of Elizabeth Montague by marriage. You can't get, get away from Montagues at this time in cultural circles. Um, now, Sancho first wrote to Stern in 1776, asking him to, to quote him, to give one half hour's attention to slavery as, as it is at this time as it is at this day practiced in the West Indies. His letters were published in 1780, two years after his death, and became a best-selling book circulating his strong views on slavery, the unchristian and most diabolical usage of my brother Negroes. He wrote about the illegality, this is his word, the illegality of the slave trade, the horrid wickedness of the traffic. For more on Sancho and other Black Londoners, you should go to a, an essential study by the historian Gretchen Gerzina, Black London, Life Before an Emancipation. Gerzina describes very vividly um, the significant Black presence in the capital. There are around five to 10,000 people of color. And she's able to show the way they experienced urban life in England in the period, drawing on documents like Sancho's letters, which, by the way, is available in a modern paperback edition like Wheatley's poems. One of Sancho's sons, incidentally, became a publisher. Now, within the Blue Stocking Circle, um, Sarah Scott, Montague's sister, was one of the first novelists to represent and condemn plantation slavery in the West Indies in a work called The History of Sir George, Sir George Ellison 
published anonymously in 1766. She was a reformer rather than a radical, but in their correspondence, Montague and Scott um, showed their enthusiasm for abolition. Um, Lizzie shared a, a let, one of the letters with me from 1788, right at the start of 1788, as the campaign for abolition of the slave trade gets going. Um, Ignatius Sancho praised Scott's novel, and in fact, he described her um, to Stern, along with Stern, as one of his favourite authors. So perhaps um, Elizabeth can carry on that theme, because um, you're, you're making it sound as if the women were in some way becoming intellectual leaders. Can we really justify thinking in that way? Absolutely. Montague is known for her leadership, not only of the salon, but also of the business in Newcastle, where she increased the, the coal trade to fund her cultural projects. So she's an extraordinarily powerful woman, a leader in many different spheres. But as an intellectual, that was her, her, her intellectual leadership was her, definitely her most prized identity. And it was as a defender of Shakespeare that she very cleverly became most famous as a writer. Her essay on Shakespeare published in the same year as Garrick's Jubilee um, defended Shakespeare as a poet of the vernacular who, hadn't, who didn't have the classical languages, similarly to women who were not generally educated in the classical texts. She also defended him against Voltaire's criticisms um, in a very witty way, showing his mistranslations of English by retranslating them back into English from his French, which is rather a, a dynamic, witty way of showing up his lack of sensitivity to the British, to the English language. So through this very close celebration of Shakespeare's language, she becomes known as a, an intellectual who's prepared to defend a different kind of drama, the, the drama the more natural drama of the people. And in fact, she gets invited to France in, in the, at the end of the 1770s to defend her position in the, in the Academy, in the French Academy of Literature, which by the way, has only on, honored a woman, Asya Jebar, in the last decade. So women, I think it's very important to remember that in this age, very few institutions allowed women to, to, to participate. And, Montague created something of an institution for women who were barred from universities, um, a space in which they could develop their intellectual conversation. And she, she made, she banked upon the philosophy, she, she very, she's very pragmatic in promoting the philosophy of the time. Women's civilizing force was something practical, leaders in conversation. Her, her salon was famous for the, for the, for its quality of conversation, which was so strictly maintained that alcohol was forbidden. <laughs> um, lemonade and hot chocolate were the favoured drinks. <laughs> um, delicacies, um, which can be stimulants to good conversation, I'm sure. <laughs> um, but what's very interesting, I think in broader terms, when we consider Montague's impact historically, is that despite her relative conservatism, she's an Anglican and she's definitely pro a moral empire, as Emma suggested, she becomes taken up by much more radical figures in the French and American revolutions. Helen Maria Williams, um, a radical contemporary of Mary Wollstonecraft, who opened a salon in, in post-revolutionary Paris, dedicated her poem, Peru, to Montague and described her salon in Portman Square as a shrine of intellect further afield, at the beginning of the 19th century, Mercy Otis Warren, um, the American writer, published her poems in Boston. And this was the first of her literary works to bear her name. And she dedicates it to Montague. Um, in a very moving passage, she celebrates Montague's achievements and says, will she across the Atlantic stretch her eye look o'er the main and view the western sky, and there Columbia's infant drama sea reflects that Britain taught us to be free. 
And it's that sense of freedom, what Anna Barbold terms freedom of the mind, which is so important to Montague, and I think makes her a very valuable figure to, to have as a resource um, in any kind of study of the 18th century, because she was also a supreme networker. <laughs> Um, Elizabeth, I, I'm going to ask you to go back, I think, to the um, material culture. Um, we, we looked at some pictures that Utica showed us earlier on of Hill Street, and um, in, in the late 1770s, I think about 1780s, she built this huge mansion in, in Portman Square. Um, and this, this was known for having, I think even the Queen visited, didn't she? Yes, um, they, she, she came with the princesses for, for breakfast and it was reported in the national papers. Um, Montague wrote rather grandly to Elizabeth Carter that um, she could read about the success of the great room in the, in the papers. She didn't have any energy left to describe it herself. Um, and we have a drawing of the great room um, as envisioned by Joseph Bonamy, her, her architect. Here you can see it's on a different scale from her previous salon. It's not really a domestic room. And I think that's what's so interesting about Montague in creating a space that is neither private or public. It has a certain sense of intimacy and cachet, and it's somewhere that everyone desires to be seen. Sociability was a very performative thing by this time, and Montague was well known for her controlling ways, creating a semicircle where people were ordered by rank and intellect to, to, to who was nearest her. And it's believed that she even asked her carpet to be designed with um, circles on the floor to guide people into groups that would promote ease of conversation. Um, so in some ways, she's an exponent of a kind of social control, but I think she's... Unfortunately, this building was bombed in the Second World War, so it's no longer possible to visit it. But we do have some extraordinary de de descriptions of it in her correspondence. And one of my favourite accounts of it is William Cooper's poem on Mrs Montague's feathered hangings, which describes this extraordinary tapestry of feathers taken from all over the world. And in many ways, they represent the fact that she collects people because several of these feathers were donated to her by correspondents from around the world over the period of her lifetime. So, for example, her, her cousin, Thomas Robinson, who had been a governor in Barbados, her brother, Robert Robinson, who's, who sadly died in the middle of his life at sea, sent her extraordinary examples of feathers. And she used them in this remarkable interior decoration, taking featherwork, which was considered to be a feminine accomplishment for fire screens or fans, and built it on a scale quite extraordinary. It covered the end, end wall of the salon and it was larger than life size. So I think that's another way in which she subtly, um, subtly uses stereotypical accomplishments to perform ambitious spectacle um, and to draw people further into her, her power. That's... Um... That's a, a, an arresting image. Um, in, the, in the spirit of the salon, we, we want to involve other people in this. So we've got quite a number of questions coming in that I'm going to put to you all uh, in a minute. Um, but I, I don't want to miss the opportunity to remind you that um, the MCO digital edition um, will launch on the 15th of October. And after that, I, I can't give you the, the URL, the, the web address today, because um, we're at the digital uh, version of, you know, painting the walls and hanging the curtains. We, we're not quite ready uh, to launch it upon the world, but it will be there in, in three weeks' time. And I'm sure that by then you will just be able to put Elizabeth Montague letters into your search engine uh, and you will find it. Um, but I want to turn to some questions. Um, there's a very interesting one come in um, from Lisa Nicholson, um, who asks us, 
whether aside from conversation, did the members of Montague Salon engage in other activities? Did they read out works together or exchange books or, or listen to lectures? Um, Emma, did, did you want to say a bit about this? Yes, most certainly. Yeah, they, they were great encouragers of each other's um, writing activities. And um, I, I love the example of um, uh, Elizabeth Montague, Elizabeth Carter, um, Catherine Talbot, the first generation of blue stockings, who um, provided tremendous moral support to each other and suggestions for where they might place their writings. Quite often they, they wrote privately circulated um, works in manuscript form among friends. And it took a, quite a lot of um, courage, actually, to take that final step into print. And so um, they, they, were, they were a terrific support network as far as um, women's entry into print culture was concerned. And uh, there's another question here from Sarah Green, which I think it, it, it steps back a bit and says, well, what do we know much about Elizabeth Montague's own education and the people who would have influenced her before she was this grand dame of, uh, of international London? Um, Elizabeth, do you want to tell us about that? Yes. Well, she was very lucky in that um, when she was a child, she was born into the gentry, um, quite a humble background relatively, and when she was a child, she went to stay with her step-grandfather who lived in Cambridge, Conyers Middleton, who was a scholar and librarian of the university. And he was also librarian to the, to, to the Earl, Earl of Oxford, who was living at, at Wimpole, a stately home close to, Cam to Cambridge. And he took his young granddaughter to visit. And Edward Harley had a daughter himself, Margaret Cavendish Harley, later Duchess of Portland, who of course was a, a great aristocratic collector and being sole child of her father inherited his incredible collection of natural history and books, the books that form the tower in the British Library, in fact, the Harley collection, um, we found their way to the British Museum at the great sale of her collection at the, after her death. So she became connected with this aristocratic learned circles at a very young age, but she was also very, she also had great initiative. During that time, she read the, ho the whole of The Spectator and copied it out at the age of eight. Um, and she was required by her grandfather to sit and listen to his conversations with academics in Cambridge um, and visitors, including Voltaire, when she was a young, young girl. And that I think that habit encouraged her very formal ability to, to converse in a way that was intellectually rigorous um, from the start. Thank you. Um, I've got a different question here, and I'd like to see if Utica could um, answer this one. It, it's a question about interracial marriage. To what extent was this common in London at the time, and what would social attitudes have been to them. Uh, you're on mute still, Utica. Thank you. Um, that's a difficult one for me because I haven't really worked on that. But I, I do understand that um, th the interracial marriages mostly um, happened in the, the colonies and in, in some cases, um, the wives came back, um, the BBs, so to speak, did come back with um, some of the officers, um, or certainly their, their children did. Um, in many cases, for example, I can speak to what happened in the Indian subcontinent, for example. Mm -hmm. um, th there were cases, for example, where um, men maintained sort of two families at a time, one family that they had left behind, um, in Britain and the other family that they started in India. And um, uh, once their tenure in India was finished, the children would then travel back 
and and reside with the uh, with the parent uh, with the uh, original family and grow up there and go to boarding schools or you know be well educated and then come up in the world like that but um this this um uh, and, and if you're interested to find out more there's a really interesting um, book by Darba Ghosh on this, um, on, on the colonial family, which you should definitely look at, which, which really talks about um, the structure of the domesticity and, 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 the inter and interracial marriages as well. Um, so I would definitely point you towards that. Thank you. That's very interesting. Now, I've got a question here. I, I don't know who to put this to. Um, it's, um, it's asking us whether the Blue Stockings discussed um, the discoveries of Caroline Herschel, um, who was, of course, an astronomer at the time from a completely different background and not part of their circle. Um, but apparently she was mentioned by Fanny Burney, and that does give us a link to the Blue Stockings because she uh, was one of the younger members of the Blue Stocking Circle. So, um, Emma, you're nodding. Can you, can you help us with this? I'm just pleased that Burney is getting a mention. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I can't, I, I'm really not sure about um, Caroline Herschel herself, but I, I am certain that they were very interested in previous generations of learned women. Um, I'm sure that, that uh, Elizabeth could say more about this, but um, there, there were many, um, interestingly, many publications at this time, um, cataloging almost brilliant women, um, from usually from about this, the, the Renaissance onwards. Um, and I think that this was seen at the time as symbolic of a country's advancement. The fact that women could share in learning, um, that uh, women were permitted an education um, and could achieve and be celebrated. You know, the very act of celebrating learned women became something of a ritual in Enlightenment Europe. Um, but maybe Elizabeth could say a bit more about the specific case of Caroline Herschel and whether um, Elizabeth Montague knew about her. I don't remember that there being a specific letter between them, but I'm sure that it's very possible that they knew of each other. Um, we'll have to look, at, look in the letters when they're on the, on the database. But I think um, they definitely appear together in several of the catalogues of famous women, such as um, Emma has mentioned. I, one of my favorites is by a very young 13 year old poet called Elizabeth Ogilvy Benger, who writes the female geniad. And she talks about knowledge being on the stretch um, in a way that's very dynamic and includes the natural sciences. I think um, a figure that we could mention here is Mary Delaney, of course, um, who, who was a great botanist as well as a, an embroiderer and is famous now for her collages, paper collages that she made of plants, specimens in the collection of her great friend, the Duchess of Portland, who I've mentioned already as being responsible for educating Elizabeth Montague. When Cook's, Cook's went to the Pacific and when Joseph Banks came back, he, he, came, he came straight to Bulstrode, the Duchess's country estate, to ask Mary Delaney to make specimens of the plants he brought back from the, from the, from the South Seas. So she was not only celebrated by fellow women, but the explorers and scientists of the day who we hear so much about in the history books um, were actually relying on women's knowledge to, to record some of their discoveries. Um, he, he could have chosen many other illustrators, but he went straight to Mary Delaney. Well, I'm getting lots and lots of questions here. Um, and one of them is, is highly topical because it's asked whether um, Elizabeth Montague in her correspondence says anything about vaccinations. Now, I, I guess vaccinations uh, uh, would be a bit later because it wasn't discovered by Edward Jenner until I think the 19th century. But of course, they did have inoculations, um, which were introduced to, um, to, to Britain by 
another Montague, Lady Mary Workley Montague, who I think Elizabeth, I'm right in saying uh, her husband was Elizabeth Montague's cousin. Um, but that's an aside. Um, tell us, can we say anything about Elizabeth Montague and inoculations? Yes, well, she, inoc she decided to inoculate herself against the smallpox, um, which her sister caught. Um, and that was a, a, a very tragic difference between them in terms of their success in society. Um, and there's a very moving letter in which she describes having to visit her sister after a period of 14 days and remain at six feet distant from her, which I think would ring lots of bells for people today. Um, it, it was very important for women to not to have their face scarred by, by the pox and it, it ruined their capital in the marriage market, just to put it bluntly. So it is a, a, a fascinating question, a topic that I think would reward a whole salon. <laughs> All right, well, well, we'll probably move on then. Um, I've, I've had a question here that we really should have addressed earlier on, which is why were they called the blue stockings? Who would like to answer that? Emma, I'll pick you. I feel that, uh, that Elizabeth has an absolute right to this, having <laughs> having worked so extensively on the blue stockings. But yes, wasn't it something about the informality? Not yes. if, I, if I'm getting this right. The informality <laughs> of the original gatherings. It was actually the men who wore the blue stockings. Mm. Is that right? Yes. The well, men in this, in this. A specific man. Result? Yes. Benjamin Stillingfleet was the first That's blue it. stocking. And, <laughs> and it was it, there was something homely about it compared to silk stockings. Is that yes. right? They were worsted socking, stockings. Yes. I think the, the, the connotation is that he was working in his study and he forgot to change into his white silk. silk. So I always liken it to the to the fact of someone today going to a gentleman's club in jeans and instead of being turned away he was welcomed by the blues who said come in your blue stockings because we are promoters of a new informality and sociability so um and what's fascinating to me is that while the blue stockings were a, a heterosocial body men and women mixing freely it was a very fashionable term and people longed to be blue stockings but as soon as it became more solidly associated with the female sex and it, it did that gradually over time because of Montague's focus on female education it then very quickly became derogatory so it's um, a mark of the misogyn misogynist labeling of history that the term has become to, to represent something far more ambivalent than it did initially. Yes but of course it would have been very rude in those days to speculate about the color of a lady's stocking Yes, those were not on view. <laughs> um, now I've got some a series of very serious questions, um, perhaps perhaps more serious than the, than the stockings. Um, and it's really what perhaps we can link them in. What was the influence of the salons? Did the did the opinions um, that Elizabeth Montague and her other salon saloniers have? Did they did they influence policy? Did they were they taken seriously? Did they ha help to change the laws? Um, and, and did they all have a similar view, or, or would you imagine that you'd have a whole variety of views in the salons, from you know radical to to conservative? So it's quite quite a serious one, that isn't it? I can't think myself that there were any laws that were actually changed. Uh, of course, a lot of the um, these women, though, were related to members of parliament. Yes. And also, I think it's worth pointing out that one of the great, the first flourishings in blue stocking history came about at the time of the argument for suffrage um, at the end of the 19th century. So that there are collectors and writers who seek out the example of the blue stockings at that point, because women are always in search of models from the past. I think what's more disturbing is that the achievements of the blues are so, so, Im so had such a great impact at the time and yet were quickly forgotten at the big for a large part of the 19th century. And 
it shows that the progress of feminism is never something simply positive. And I think that's something that the British Library is brilliant in addressing in its forthcoming exhibition about the history of the progress of women's rights, because there have been always been periods at which people have argued strongly for women's right to be included. But it's it has also been been periods where she's been where women have been utterly restricted from having a public voice. That's a good point, and I'm glad you made that um, because this this whole panel really was inspired by the exhibition uh, that the British Library is putting on, which should have um, been launched this spring, but of course other things took over. Um, but it will be launched in in October, about the same time as the the Emco site, and this is called Unfinished Business: The Fight for Women's Rights. And I think the exhibition itself is taking a slightly different, uh, a slightly later historic time period from the one we've been talking about, really from the, the middle of the 19th century up until today. And we could tell from the title, Unfinished Business, that they're, they're saying that there are still things to be done today. So we've, we've sneaked in the blue stockings here really as precursors um, of those 19th and 20th century women who, who took up different um, different causes. And so actually, I, I think I might finish by asking each of you in turn to speculate, because I've had a very interesting question here, which is what, if, if, the, if the, the Montague Salonistas were around today, what would they be looking to reform? What would they want to change or to influence, do we think, in today's society or culture? Um, yeah, well, I mean, I think um, the, the fact that the salon, um, you know, operated in the way that it did and it was so, um, in a way it was exclusive, but also inviting. Um, mm -hmm. It was intimate, but it had a global outlook. Um, so I, I suppose one can compare it in a way to the sort of new digital culture in a way that's, that's, um, that's starting where you know, very much like our digital salon at the moment, right? And uh, you might find, um, you might you might find more sort of these um, small focus groups or small discussion groups, you know, that are coming up and and taking up a cause. And I think very much uh, the environment would be one <laughs> very mm -hmm. primary thing on their mind. And I'm sure um, they would be very very vocal about that as well. I'm sure that's right. Um, Emma. Yes, I mean, they were women with great, um, of great capacity. And there's no doubt that Elizabeth Montague herself would have made a brilliant prime minister. Um, <laughs> but uh, I think that um, the, they, they were incredibly good at forging alliances with men who did have actual social and political power and so I think indirectly they did have quite a, a big impact on um, policy sometimes in government probably um, but also um, the tone of public life and I think that one cause they would have embraced very wholeheartedly is the um, everyday sexism movement um, begun by Laura Bates. Um, I think they would have, they're very concerned uh, about equality, gender equality in language. And, um, and I think that's what comes across very much in the correspondence. I think it will, it will demonstrate, you know, this wonderful sort of innovative, um, equal discourse between male and female intellectuals that really they, they, uh, they established in a central way in British culture. Elizabeth? Yes, I think I'd follow on from Emma there and agree that um, they were primarily concerned with promoting judgment and critical, this critical intelligence through education and writing. I think for, for women, they, they really highlighted the connection between writing and rights the importance of having a voice depends upon a crit critical judgment. What's fascinating about Montague is that she managed to combine this with 
quite a material brilliance and splendor. I'm not sure what they would think of the inequality of today's society and the fact that two thirds of the world don't have access to education. I think that's a very important question for feminists today. And global feminism is about recognizing those inequalities which haven't been um, addressed. But at, at her historical moment, I think Montague was a great figure for pointing out the importance of language in, in law. Mary Wollstonecraft's Vindication of the Rights of Woman was one of many texts she wrote, including an autobiographical novel in which she tells the story of her life as an individual. I think that the, the great emphasis on enlightenment selfhood that Montague is also fascinated by is something that these women could, can teach us today when we're thinking about modern feminism. Well, that seems to me like a very good place to stop. Um, I'm sorry for all of those who have put in questions that we haven't had time to answer, um, but I really appreciate uh, all the contributions that everybody has made that have enabled us to hold this discussion. Uh, and I am very grateful to our panelists, panelists, Utica, Emma and Elizabeth, for joining us today. And thank you for all of the, th those of you in the audience as well. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you to the brilliant speakers in our digital salon, to Lizzie, Joanna, Utica and Emma. And thank you to you for joining us. Please make a donation to the British Library if you can, and be sure to check out the rest of our events programme. Thank you.